Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of my Women in Technology Spotlight. Today, I'm here with Eva Maria Hempe. She's the Director, Enterprise Accounts for CIMIA at VMware. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. Great to be here. Hi, Eva. Thank you for coming on my show, as I like to call it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the first question I usually ask, and that is, um, what would you like to tell me about yourself? Give us a little bit of background about your person. I don't know. I think the main thing about me is I'm just somebody with a very diverse set of interests and backgrounds. And there's just a whole a lot of things that excite me and that interest me. So I think that was um, that was always the case and also always sports and to some degree competition played some role in my life and I grew up with a bunch of boys so in my neighborhood I was the only girl <laughs> which was really funny because I then went to an all-girls school um, after secondary school because also in elementary school they were just boys um, uh, but then I somehow it's kind of it seems to swing back and forth um, but I, I still do I mean I played football I love mountains I do lots of like mountaineering and started really early with my parents and my grandparents. Um, and now I also do skiing and ski touring and via ferratas and rock climbing. I also recently bought, bought a mountain bike in addition to the two road bikes I already own. So this is, this is just a really important part of my life. And um, I do some sports which are more competition oriented, but I also I, some sports which are more about yourself and challenging yourself and developing yourself and pushing your own your own boundaries so i think yeah that's and i, I also i like the the adventure so i did some quite adventurous travel i think a few years ago uh, a few more years ago maybe so like 13 14 years ago so i traveled across china without speaking chinese before the age of internet i just had like this lonely planet guidebook and i kind of knew okay i want to get from so down here to beijing and i have a week to do that so um yeah i think that's just like a little bit of a adventurous spirit and a little bit of a competitive spirit yeah, I hear that you are really active and really adventurous. So that's already two very interesting traits there. <laughs> From a family background, did you grow up uh, with siblings or did you, were you a single child? No, I have two siblings. I've got a brother and a sister and my brother, we're very close in age. So we're only 14 months apart. So he was part of the neighborhood boys gang. And so was I. So yeah, we, we were very close growing up. <laughs> So in your family, was uh, technology a topic? Because obviously, I mean, I, I hear you do a lot of sports, you're active, you're adventurous, but now you're a woman in IT as well, which is very specific. Um, so I would be interested in understanding how you got there. Yeah. It's actually funny because uh, as a little kid, so my, my dad was very much into computers very early on. Although funny enough, he then became a text consultant and a CTA, but um, as a kid, basically my, my cradle was next to the needle printer. So I like, and I mean, the birth announcement card was my dad did it himself on the needle printer. You can see all of that. And I got my first computer probably at age six or seven. So it was like an old laptop. It was like the size of a brick from my dad. I think it died in 2000. It was the one computer which didn't survive <laughs> the Y2K bug, but that was my first one. And then when I was 10, yeah, I bought my, I, I saved some money with babysitting and stuff. And I bought my first real computer. Um, and so I had in my room, I had my computer and then I had this big 17 inch uh, <laughs> monitor. And I was one of the first ones to have also a, 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 a CD writer. Um, I was very proud of that. My family was funny because at some point then we all had our own computers in our rooms, like long before that was a thing. And we had our own home network. And so all the computers in the house were networked, but none of them had internet. The only computer which had the internet was the one in the kitchen. So we had a computer in the kitchen and all my friends thought it was hilarious. that if she came to our house, there was this computer in the kitchen. Although I mean, in retrospect, I think it was quite smart for my parents because that way they had some sort of control over what we were doing online, even in those days where internet was still very much more innocent than it is today, but yeah. 
That sounds amazing. I mean, um, first computer at six and then with 10, 11, buying your own computer with your pocket money. 2,000 marks. Yeah, it was 2,000 oh. marks. I still remember yeah, that. That's a lot of babysitting, though. <laughs> I also made some money with computers as well. I, had a, I ran a side business during school, like programming websites in HTML for I could, one of my dad's colleagues for who was like a CPA and, and text consulting company. So I did their website and I built a forum even, I think with some code and yeah. <laughs> so obviously you kind of grew up with the internet. So you were, I mean, I feel that when you were there at the onset of this technology, you have this deeper understanding um, and, and the possibility, you had the possibility to evolve inside of this technology. And I think that's what you did at a very, very early age. So, um, okay, that, that's interesting. And I love that. I love, especially that at this young age, you already were, had the spirit of entrepreneurship <laughs> <laughs> and built it up. Um, there's something else I would like to talk about. You said that you went to an all girls school, yeah. um, a, a middle school, I think it was. Yeah, first two years of high school, fifth and sixth grade. Okay. That's also interesting because there's a, I think there's a distinct difference between going to school with boys and with girls. There used to be uh, this theory, I don't know if it's still valid because I haven't looked into it, that girls learn better in an all girls environment. Did you have this experience that there was a difference between the way you uh, learned before or when you were in this all girls school or I don't know. As I said, for me, going to the all-girls school, well, it was several reasons. There were several secondary schools in town. I also, I just, I just liked the atmosphere. It was, it was even a Catholic all-girls school run by nuns. So the, the full cliche. Um, but it just had this atmosphere and the spirit. It was sort of very calm. It had this old buildings and it just felt much more welcoming than some of the, the mixed, big, modern building, thousands of kids. And so I, I was also drawn to that. And I think also as a reaction to always being the only girl. And um, I mean, actually, it's kind of funny. We had also this very stereotypical games as kids. We played family. And because I was the only girl, I always had to be the mother. And the mother always like uh, was, I had to sit at home which was like written in chalk on the road somewhere and wait for the father and the kids to come back and I think it probably scared me for life this kind of childhood experience so I, I was for me it was also a way to kind of break out of a place where I was always the only girl in elementary school there were six girls and 20 boys in the classroom into somewhere where this was a bit taken away and I think those two years at the old girls school were actually the the happiest of my school career I just felt I was able to be myself I don't know I, I had always a good attitude for math also for lots of other subjects but indeed it was like there was nothing like okay it's math for girls or not I mean we're just girls so that's, that's one of us has to be the best and I went on actually to study physics so I, I did my my main subjects in high school at the end were math and English and then I went on to study physics and I ended up earning a PhD in engineering so I kind of went back to, to, the, to the boys club, but for me, I think I never, I never struggled with, okay, is math or is science something for me or not? I just knew this was something I, I was good at. And so I just didn't, didn't care too much of whether I'm supposed to be good at this or not. I just knew I was, and it's, it's quite likely that maybe having those two years in like a protected environment was part of that. Actually, what you just told me about um, not having to think about whether you're a girl or a boy or if you're supposed to be good at math or not good at math and or this or science maybe is something that's actually uh, part of this theory that women that that girls are um, more themselves in all girls schools they don't have to worry about you know how they are perceived or against you know the, the view of the boys and, and stuff like that so it might be you will never know probably <laughs> but i think it's an interesting concept because i haven't actually met anyone who has actually been in an all girls school so it's interesting that you said they were the happiest play, uh, time of your school life so you went on to study physics which is also interesting for me because i have a phd in chemistry obviously so um yeah <laughs> we are both not um from we both moved from from natural science into into computers obviously what uh, what uh, triggered your interest in physics because you have this background with computers but then you did something with actually natural sciences 
it is funny because I actually and I was in America after year 10 for a year so just before starting the the final two years of secondary school and so I came back and very quickly had to make up my mind on what are my my focus areas for the final two years and you had to pick two out of three sciences and I originally wanted to pick biology and chemistry um, I, I kind of always like chemistry so I was going to do chemistry for two years and biology for one year because a friend of mine was like hey super easy there's loads of commonality between those two subjects you make your life a lot easier if you just if you do the two but the the teacher in charge for like picking your subjects he he knew me from before and he was a math and physics teacher so when I came to him and said okay this is my choice of subjects he just looked at me and with this very thick Bavarian accent told me that's nonsense you're going to do two years of physics and if it has to be you're going to do one year of chemistry that's enough and I was just like, I was not going to pick a fight with him. So I figured, okay, whether I do one year of uh, physics or one year of biology doesn't really matter. And I can still switch it back next year. And then I just, I just thought physics was quite interesting. Um, and it was a bit of a challenge. Like a lot of the other subjects were, were quite easy for me. But in physics, it was, it was a little was challenge. It was interesting as well to sort of understand how things Fit together and, and make me sense of things. And I ended up actually sitting my final exams in physics as my third subject besides math and English. And then when it came to what to study, I was a bit torn. But again, I think the reason to study physics was more that I felt it was one of the subjects I could still learn most at university. So I also thought about more economics or some some other subjects or even my English teacher was very disappointed my German teacher that I wouldn't go into modern languages but I just felt that what a university education would allow me and the kind of ways to push my knowledge is quite unique in a science like you can do labs and I mean I did some some cool things I was in eventually in Italy at a synchrotron and did uh, synchrotron experimentation I was inside a nuclear reactor where we did like where there were some experiments with the radiation from that reactor so it did get me to some very exciting places and I actually even at some point I understood what the Higgs boson was and how like quantum field theory worked I forgot everything since but it, it was indeed it was sort of this 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 challenge which I think I said very beginning of the conversation I, I was always kind of motivated by, by challenges and pushing myself so I just felt that physics would be a intellectual intellectual challenge and um, just widen my horizon and I mean to be honest I was also quite attracted that with physics it felt like it would keep quite a lot of options open in terms of what I could do afterwards so I did talk to a few people who had studied physics before and the one thing was like it wasn't really clear where it leads to there's nothing like oh I'm a physicist it's not like studying medicine where you're a medical doctor at the end but I also thought that was actually quite appealing to me yeah, I feel this so much. Uh, a lot of the things you said resonate with me because uh, it was, for me, it was chemistry, obviously, but it was also, you know, when I went to university, it was this decision to do something that still challenges me because I could also have gone into languages. I could have, I don't know, studied German or French or, or whatever, but there was this, this the feeling that natural sciences and chemistry would be more difficult um mm -hmm. therefore more challenging so i i definitely mm -hmm. feel this this um aspect of your story very personally um so you studied physics and you even had the possibility to work um uh, at, at really interesting experimental sites and and all that but then now you're you you switch back to to it where you came from uh, as a young girl what what made you go i mean i it's true you have more options when you study physics and you can actually just go anywhere that requires an analytical mind i think um <laughs> but what made you go into it well, there's this big block in between. I actually I spent Ooh. eight and a half years uh, as a management consultant. So I was actually at a strategy consulting firm. I went up to associate partner at Bain Company following my PhD. And actually my PhD, I think, was part of the first pivot. So I, I studied I started a physics PhD, but then a year in, I basically I felt it was too theoretical and I wanted to do something that had to do more with the real world. So I actually had changed and I looked at 
how engineering design can be applied to the development of healthcare services in the UK. So I like this kind of taking this very analytic mindset, which I have, and then applying it to the real world. And then following that, I originally wanted to design healthcare systems. So that was the thing I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of figure out how to bring healthcare to emerging economies and also how to solve all the myriad of problems we have with healthcare systems in the in the developed world. But it turns out it's not so easy. If you have a, um, a master's degree in physics and a PhD in engineering design to kind of convince the World Health Organization that you're the good candidate for their health systems programs. So I then thought, okay, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a sidestep and I joined one of the big management consulting firms to basically also build the, the business skill set and the more, more credibility in that area. And then eventually I would go back to, to healthcare. And, and then, so I just, I just liked what I did. I mean, I thought again, solving real problems uh, with an analytical mindset um, just suited me really well. I got some really great opportunities. Um, work brought me to Switzerland in the end through an externship at the World Economic Forum. And I then towards the end turned more into digital. So I was part or was one of the leaders in our digital uh, practice where we had designers and engineers and we were really trying to build digital products for our our clients. Mm -hmm. But then it was like, okay, so now what's next? And I always felt that we were we were short when we talked about digitalization. So I mean I I understand how product design works, I understand how digital product design works. I did engineering design back in my PhD and then all the way to design thinking. But then there was always this place where it turned technical and where it turned into more, okay, so now what does this mean for our, how do we scale this? How we, do we not just have one great digital lighthouse project, but how do we actually pivot our company and pivot all of that? And so that then in the end drew me to VMware and got the second pivot in my career, the change. I said, okay, now I'll, I'll go back to the very early stage I go back to IT and I really want to understand better what really drives digitalization. Um, and I mean, my current role at VMware is it's not very tech, it's not very technical. It's much more about strategies and it's, it's about really driving also, it's driving two transformations actually. It's driving um, the external transformation of digitalization at um, our, all our customers at the world's largest companies. I mean, I'm an enterprise, so I work with some of the world's biggest names, but it's also driving our internal transformation as VMware. So how do we deal with a more complex product portfolio? How can we really become a strategic partner in that external transformation? Mm -hmm. And what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the process, how we engage with our customer, how we sell, but also how we think about our customers? It's like, what are the, the ways I can really add value to that particular customer and being more strategic also in, in what you do in which sequence. And so in a way it feels like it's, it's kind of coming together like the, the front end digitalization, which is what a lot of the customers see, then like, okay, how to make it happen. But then also the, the strategizing and the business building, which I took out of well, almost nine years in consulting. Mm -hmm. There's two things I would love to talk about. And that one is that I feel you have this wealth of experience, not only in terms of your education, but from what you told me, I hear that you lived in Italy, but you seem to have lived in the UK as well and in other places. So you have this cultural diversity um, knowledge because you had to mm -hmm. obviously to adapt to different environments. Um, do you feel that helps you with what you're doing now? You know, this this uh, diverse view of the world? Yeah, I think I actually lived in five countries. I lived in Germany, I lived in the US, UK, yeah. spent some time in Japan, and I'm, I'm now in Switzerland. And then I, of course, with Spain, I, I've spent almost a year in, um, in Sweden at some point in time and, and other places. So I, I do think it does help because you're just taking less things for granted. So it's always like, yes, I have my worldview, which is set on a set of experiences and also on a set of um, unspoken agreements. But for somebody else, it might be very different. To me, like one of the things in the UK, I was dating a, a Brit back then and we had a conversation. I, I really wanted to go sailing. And 
he was like, well, we just, we haven't spent that much time together. And then in the end, he's like, well, do what you think is right. <laughs> and me being German, I, of course, I took that very literal. Okay, I do what I think is right. And what I think is right, I'll go silly. What I didn't notice back then was that actually this was not at all what he meant, but the British culture is very much about not saying certain things or just expecting other people to know. And him saying, do what you think is right was basically his way of saying, no, don't go, stay, stay here and spend the weekend with me. So yeah, it, it kind of built up over the different experience in different places I've been. Also sometimes not speaking the language, like when I traveled China and it just, yeah, comes together as being quite, and I think quite sensitive, but also I, I think um, some appreciation that there's just a loads of different ways that get you to the same goal. And I usually, I try to be more towards enabling and empowerment because I know that my way, the way I would do it is just one way to get there. But actually some of the greatest things is when you're surprised and you give somebody else the freedom to find their own solution. And then they come back with something like, wow, it's just so much better than what I could have done. <laughs> That's a, a very amazing perspective. And um, there, I think communication, um, when you are, you know, when you have this, this experience of, of different cultures and different communication types, helps you understand that there is no universal communication. What you said was that we take certain things for granted. They're, they're implicit in the things we say. But having that experience that you have, you can now understand that there's so much more to communication and you can when you talk mm. about not speaking the language you have to be more open to visual and non-verbal cues so this is all that that comes together and and i think helps you with with your skills in communicating with the different teams and the different customers and the different environments that you find i mean also the ember is a very multicultural uh, society very diverse nowadays actually which brings me to another topic and um, that is um, what exactly your role is. That was the second thing I would like to talk about. Because I obviously know what you do, but what can you maybe explain to someone who is not familiar with our structures or our way of working, what it is you do on a daily basis? It's actually a really good question, what I do on a daily basis. Um, so I, I, I think of it as having sort of two hats on. And the one hat is to be a change agent for our enterprise team. So, I mean, we are we're split into enterprise and commercial and I mean, easy way to think about it. Enterprise are our biggest customers. And so I'm responsible for all these customers in all of central EMEA. So that's uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, but also Russia and for enterprise, Israel and Poland. And so my role is to yeah, act as a change agent for all the account teams we have in that area to become better and to become um, yeah to come on the journey towards being a subscription company but towards being a software as a service company and that can be very practical things like okay how big or i have some input in it it's on me to decide all of that but what should be the territories uh, being also behind the driving to being more condensed and focusing on fewer accounts, but that means having more time and being able to build better relationships with those fewer accounts. Um, but then also bring in new skill sets and new tools. So I have a, a team of, we call them advisors. So some of them are, have a consulting background. Some of them have been CIOs before, and they are part of the, account teams and they bring in the strategic view and um, being able to link the business imperatives of our customers to what we can deliver but really thinking starting from the customer not so much oh here's a lot of product with your customer which one do you want to buy but more getting to a point of like okay dear customer what is it you're trying to do what are what are your problems and how is that linked to it and then how can we help you and then also i have people who are more into then understanding the technicalities of how you shape a deal, how you build a good deal, understanding what the customer already has, and then also linking with some of the system integrators and system outsourcers, which are also becoming more important because they are often then the ones running hard or like even outsourcing the solutions and the workload. So this is the one part of like this enabling, very working very directly with the sales teams and kind of understanding that. 
And then the other part is also I work very closely with the regional VP for Semea and also helping him thinking to some of the more strategic things for the region. It's often very closely aligned with the other role, but that sense of taking it kind of up one, one notch in terms of, okay, what do we think is important? Where do we think we should set our priorities? What's the key things also to help our organization? How can we, how can we drive change? And how can we, um, as a VMware Semea team, step up and do the next step? Mm -hmm. okay. What I hear is that you have a very good um, position to actually understand what our customers are currently struggling with, what uh, their main uh, focus is at the moment, where they are going. And that leads me to a question I don't usually ask, but what really interests me is, what do you see as strategic initiatives in our customers at the moment? What are the things that are driving them? What are the projects they're working on? What is the current, um, yeah, top of minds, maybe. What, what do you see? Is it digital transformation? Is it security? What, what is it that's going on? I think it depends. It depends also on the industry you're looking at. And there are some industries where digitalization is more externally driven, where it's like, basically, I had one customer tell me, well, I have to go to the cloud. If I don't want to write my own MS Word in three years time, I just have to do this. So there's for quite a few of them, it becomes like an imperative, whether it is through the, the landscape around them, like this example that you just might not be able to purchase like a non-cloud license for certain programs at some point in time. Uh, then there's also more shareholder driven and it's like, okay, we, we have to do something, we can't be left behind. Um, but then there's also like, I think the companies which are more visionary and then it's about, okay, how can we, create new businesses around digital? How can we stay relevant in the future? Um, what are the key things we need, to, we need to do to create also new revenue models and to protect our current revenue streams? So I think there's a quite a big, um, a big span. And I mean, usually if you talk to the executives, they think less about the infrastructure. They think more about the things to do customer facing. Um, but it then all comes down to like, how can you, how can you deliver it? How can you scale it? I mean, what you also see is often bringing also some of the, the mindsets into a broader company. So a lot of companies are trying to become more agile. They want to become faster in doing things. They want to become um, like more distributed. But then again, like how do you ensure that with that, you don't end up with sort of a huge unmanageable variety. So it's a little bit about sort of striking and I sometimes it's also like it's a, the pendulum goes back and forth, back and forth between very top down and, and structure and, and very sort of less fair and then it goes back. But kind of how do you also then manage all this variety and still have possibilities to realize economies of scale? I think that's also really important. So the, it depends a little bit who you talk to, but for all of them, then usually the question is like, so what does this mean for me? Um, both in terms of threats or in terms of opportunities. And it usually is both. And then as a second step, often you have the more practicalities of, okay, when I do all this, but then what does it mean? Where's, where does security, where does risk come in? Mm -hmm. Um, you said earlier that you um, went from that consultancy position to VMware because you felt that you wanted to be in a space where you could actually deliver solutions, or that's how I understood it. And um, I was wondering if you feel that working for VMware gives you the opportunity to be at the forefront of digital transformation at the moment. Is that a reason for your decision to be at VMware? to be part of all these, these strategies and, and transformations? Definitely, I mean, uh, just the whole question of, I mean, and there's a lot of very strategic questions in there. I mean, as I said before, it's often not front of mind to the people making decisions, but there's a lot behind, like if you decide, okay, yeah, I have to do something with cloud, but then what are the trade-offs you're making? And um, do you gonna, and there's some interesting research out there that most CIOs, do not want to be locked in, but most of them de facto are. 
but then like what does this mean and then often also like they're not that aware of the different options they have and sort of avoiding this lock in and where does it lead what opportunities does it create so there's loads of really interesting strategic questions there and yeah i mean also just the the breadth of companies we work with also reflects our strategic importance and so it's about kind of what is the next thing that is so pervasive as virtual machines were and really changing the way business is done and i think um the the things we do around multi-cloud hybrid cloud and, and kind of having a uniform layer which goes across wherever you are and for all your applications i think is something that's potentially really powerful in getting from the experimentation and trying out things and like the almost the um, manufacture like the, the very sort of small boutique area of kind of driving new digital ideas to something that's actually scalable across large organizations mm -hmm. I asked you a very leading question there because uh, what I was thinking was a lot of people don't realize what VMware does. And I feel that, you know, talking a little bit about how strategic we are for our customers might actually help us make us more sexy on the job market for more female candidates. You know? So that was what I was doing. I'm sorry. Actually, I wrote I wrote a blog on LinkedIn when I when I joined. And it was also, I think the first paragraph was about like, what is VMware? I think I wrote something like it's the largest software company you might have never heard about. So I think that's still true. Oh, that's so cool. Maybe you can send me the link and I will link it under our interview because I think that's something that's very valid that a lot of people haven't heard about what we do while we're, I think at the, at the moment, uh, uniquely positioned to, to lead customers in or help customers with their transformation to that multi-cloud, hybrid cloud environment that we are going to see in the future. Yeah, I mean, also just the poor pitch of like you have so many things you have to get right for this new world, this new infrastructure, and you can spend a lot of time as a customer trying to puzzle it all together, or you can actually get it all from out of one hand with the guarantee that it fits and you don't have to kind of try to force it together. And I think that's a very powerful narrative to kind of really free up your scarce IT resources. I mean, we all know that there is a scarcity of talent in this area. And instead of kind of trying them to, puzzle things together, have them really work on the cool things, which is end customer facing and not so much internally focused. Yes, very true, very true. And you touched on something that's also very important. <laughs> it's the scarcity of talent that we're seeing. And that's a scarcity of talent in different ways. It's uh, on a whole scale, we have too few people uh, to actually support the whole digital transformation. And we're seeing this. And the other thing I feel is we have a scarcity of diverse talent and of women in the field. So obviously it's changing and there are more women coming into the field, but they're still not enough. And um, if you were to give advice to a young woman who is vaguely interested in technology um, or a young girl starting out uh, deciding what she might want to study, what would your recommendation be? Because you have this wealth of experience, really. <laughs> All right, just before I answer that question, I just want to say I'm actually very, very positive surprised that at VMware, what I really love about the way we approach diversity is that it's it's done from a business imperative. It's not like, oh, we should have more women because it looks good, but that there's this real conviction that it, it will make us more successful in business because 50% of the people out there are women. So like, why should we just design? And there my, my, my design background comes through as well. Like if I just design for myself, I'm a very different person to you. So if I design something that might be perfect for you, it might not be the right thing for, you, for somebody else like, like you. So it's about having this wealth of experience internally to really address the, be representative of the problems we're facing externally. So I think, and I, I think that's something that, that's very pervasive at VMware. And I think that's super important as a starting point. It's not diversity for diversity's sake, but there's a real appreciation of the business imperatives behind it. Thank you for touching on that, because that's a very important point, really, understanding that diversity is not diversity for diversity's sake, because this is not a charitable organization, really. I mean, um, to understand that diversity will lead to better products and obviously then to more revenue is pivotal uh, to understand why diversity is such a big agenda at VMware. And uh, I also feel that there's a lot of drive and, and very good initiatives around it. So yeah, I agree. Thank you for mentioning that. 
But like, what's your other question? Like, what I would, uh, what I would recommend to somebody just starting out? I think it's about, it's about. I just talked to my mentor this morning, and he told me, "Be brave, be brave. Like, don't, um, don't be shy." And um, he also said, "Like, yes, I mean, he'll always have more experience than me because he's just like twenty years older. Like, I'll never catch up." So it's about kind of focusing on on what you can add, and I mean, also. I mean, there's tons of people at VMware who know a lot more about the technical solutions, who have closed a lot more deals than I have, but I still have something I can contribute from my background, from the perspective I bring. And I think it's it's very easy to focus on the things others do better, but I think the important thing is also to be mindful of your own differentiated set of strengths, which you bring to the party. And I guess back to what we also discussed about culturals and diversity. I mean, it's also not, not everybody has to be everything. I mean, that's why we work in teams because everybody brings their strengths and then together uh, we can come up with even better answers than each of us could do individually. I think it's about this, yeah, focus on your own strengths, um, kind of just also thinking, I, I sometimes thought also when I came to decisions, what's the worst that could happen? And then often it's actually, it's not so bad, like the worst thing that can happen. And then you just, you just go. And I mean, another check I sometimes did to myself was like, what, how would I feel five years down the line if I don't take this now, if I don't do this now, would I regret it? And then if I felt, yes, I would regret this. Like, even if it's a bit scary and I don't quite know what I'm getting myself into, but um, then I just, I just took the plunge. I think that's some some sort of mindset shift, like getting out of the immediate and more like taking a bit of bigger picture, like mm-hmm. where does it fit with what you want to be? And is this something that's that's for you? But then also don't try to be something or somebody you're not. I mean, you're all very individual and it's about finding the right place for you with like ability to sort of stretch and become a better version, but a better version of yourself. Mm-hmm. So what do you, I heard was, and I totally agree is be brave, you know, understand that everyone has something to bring to the table. And um, what I also heard is that you have a mentor. That's something that came up a lot uh, during my <laughs> interviews. So is that something you would also recommend to get a mentor and to find someone to guide you a little bit? Yeah, it just has to be the right person. And that what the right person is also might change throughout the course of your career. So back at university, I had somebody who worked for like a a German industrial manufacturing conglomerate. And that was kind of helpful as a way to sort of see, okay, what what works. And now my mentor is actually, he works for a large Swiss bank. Um, But it's, it's very helpful for me to also challenge my mindset around leadership and around where I want to be. And he sometimes, I don't know if you ever will listen to this, but he's sometimes quite brutal and he also knows that, but it also kind of gets me out of my comfort zone, but it has, we were matched through a program, but it has to be something that's organic. Like my first mentor, at some point he was like, I, I think I can't help you anymore. And so he tried to get me another person as a mentor and we just didn't, we just didn't click so well. And so that be, I still in touch with that that replaced the mentor, but it became, it was a, a fit, not as a deep relationship, but so I think sometimes it's also, it has to be, you have to be intentional, what you want to get out of it and then who's the right person for you at your particular stage in your career or in your life. Because I mean, life and career is also entwined. I mean, a lot of things connect to each other. Like if you're, what's your personal situation might affect certain things available to you on a career path or let certain career decisions might necessitate certain trade-offs in in personal life. True. So this was such an interesting conversation and as usual I feel I could just keep talking to you for a long time but I have to you know have an eye on the time and I think uh, we have to be aware that our viewers have limited time as well but um, this was great. Thank you so much Ava. Thank you. Great uh, conversation. Um, so, uh, if people who would like to get in touch with you, I will put your LinkedIn profile under the interview, if that is okay with you. Okay. Yeah. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.